I'm Robert Schmuckler-Reese, and this is Srinivas Sayadavara. Uh, we wanted to discuss some of the aspects of the uh, paper that was just published in OncoTarget on uh, PIP3 binding proteins and what they might mean for longevity and neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, the origins of this work go back to a discovery we made uh, how long ago? In 2008. 2008, eight years ago, of a, an extreme long-lived mutant that actually had previously been discovered in two different labs, uh, uh, two different versions of that mutation. Um, but what we realized was that it was extremely long-lived. And that I credit to Srinivas. He, uh, he had the patience and the uh, conviction to give the, these worms the time to develop and, uh, and to age. And it made, lasted six months, and most people expect worms to expire in two to three weeks. So other labs had kind of given up on the worms as, uh, as, as arrested development uh, mutants. But Srini realized that they were actually extremely robust, long-lived, stress-resistant, ten times normal lifespan. So they're actually uh, a world record for life extension. And uh, this without apparently any compromise in their health and fitness, the one sacrifice they make is that they are infertile, uh, completely infertile at this point. So this was a mutation in the PI3 kinase class 1 uh, gene, and that gene encodes a protein that makes PIP3. PIP3 is a tethering molecule that resides in cell membranes, and in particular the inner plasma membrane of cells. and it's the kind of the anchor point for tethering a whole bunch of uh, signaling molecules, including uh, kinases and uh, phosphatases that are involved in insulin-like signaling, uh, IGF-1 signaling, uh, protein kinase C signaling. And because of that property, the uh, absence of PIP3 in the mutant worms somehow was silencing all of these signaling pathways which you'd think would make the worm less fit, but in fact, in a benign laboratory environment, made them extremely fit. So this sounds like uh, this is a great recipe for following up with a uh, drug intervention. And uh, you might, because the worms are very fit, long-lived, and infertile, get a combined pill, birth control pill and longevity pill. Now, what a market for that, right? But um, the problem is, of course, that um, PIP3 and the en enzyme that makes it PIP3K are necessary for cell division. So this would this would not only prevent replication, but it pre would prevent um, stem cell niches from replicating. So it's probably not a great idea to knock out the gene completely in all cell types. But what we thought would be worth pursuing was the proteins downstream of it that it actual that actually depend on PIP3 for membrane tethering some of which, uh, the AKT branch in particular, are important for re cell replication. But the others, as yet undiscovered at that time, uh, might be the ones that confer the fitness and longevity traits. So uh, Srinivas uh, worked out a protocol uh, to isolate these by uh, affinity absorption. And uh, it, it worked extremely well. The proteins that were known to be PIP3 specific, that is to bind it much more avidly um, than its substrate, which is the much more abundant, sometimes a thousandfold more abundant, PIP2. Um, that's the precursor. So the PIP3 specific proteins, only a few had been characterized definitively. And those, the AKT branch mediates the replication effects of insulin-like signaling. Uh, but the other proteins that bind PIP3 were really not defined, and we thought these may very well mediate the beneficial effects apart from replication. So uh, doing a kind of census of isolating these proteins seemed like a really good idea. So Srini developed the protocol, as I said, and isolated a, a panel of proteins, and we characterized these. First of all, we saw far few fewer mutants far fewer proteins in the mutant worms. Yeah, because um, they lack PIP3. Which genetically lack PIP3. Right, which genetically, because of a truncation and non-sense mutation on the phosphatidyl non-sterotic kinase. 
they don't make any PIP3. We have shown that in uh, the 2008 paper that it doesn't make any PIP3. So in the absence of PIP3, the proteins that bind to PIP3 cannot go to, go to the membrane to relay and uh, also amplify the signal. So thereby um, lowering the activity or truncating the signaling cascades that are mediated by PIP3. And uh, we identified several different proteins um, uh, that are specific and we even through modeling, we identified that they are specific to PIP3 more than PIP2. And uh, let me emphasize that that was a, that was actually kind of a tour de force for molecular dynamic modeling. Right. Uh, Sundaram Balasubramaniam in our group is, is a bioinformatics specialist and he developed uh, protocols yeah, to do the modeling in which he actually showed that uh, about half of the candidates that we identified by proteomics of the um, uh, immuno affinity, I'm sorry, uh, just affinity uh, binding, that about half of them bound preferentially to PIP3 more than any of the uh, random proteins that he tested. So it looks like it's actually working very specifically. Right. The other thing I wanted to add to was Srini had this really cool idea that maybe if we fed worms PIP3 so in a soluble form, that they go back to the membrane. And we reversed most of these proteins. They By adding, by feeding the worms with PIP, exogenous PIP3, we found reversal of uh, like uh, half of the proteins go back to the membrane. And basically, if you look at the membrane fraction of a, a worm that lacks PAP3 and, and compare it to wild type, 89% of the proteins, like more, close to 90% of proteins are there. So we are looking at only 10% of proteins that are missing in the membrane. And these are all supposed to be PAP3 binding. And uh, among those, 40% of those 11% that is missing in the membrane fraction, they go back when you add exogenous PAP3, suggesting that these are in fact specific to PAP3 and uh, you're adding PAP3 back to the medium, the bombs, um, the proteins that are in the cytosolic fraction go back and get tethered to the membrane. That's what we have identified. It's, it's an experimental way to actually test whether the proteins being in the isolated fraction depends on PIP3. If you can right. add back PIP3 and suddenly they're back, that works. It probably only works for the ones that are doing it in the intestine because the soluble PIP3 probably doesn't get it any further than the intestine. That's, right. that's our explanation anyway. The, the next step was to look for functional roles of some of these downstream proteins that bind PIP3. And for that, we exploited some uh, models that had been developed in other laboratories of protein aggregation mimicking the kinds of aggregation that occur in neurodegenerative diseases, specifically Alzheimer's. We had a couple of Alzheimer's aggregation models and Parkinson's. We had an alpha synuclein um, model for that that forms aggregates in the worms. And interestingly, five of the 18 PIP3 specific binding proteins that we had identified, Srini had identified by proteomics, actually turned out to have functional roles mediating, uh, or actually when we knock them down, it, it reduced aggregation. So they do mediate aggregate formation in these worm aggregation models. Um, that was pretty amazing and, and, and even more amazing when we tested the five that worked against aggregation for effects on lifespan. Four of the five actually extended lifespan by eight to 20 percent. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And uh, most of the proteins that we found in the in the PIP3 enriched uh, fraction, actually, these proteins have a role in neurodegeneration or longevity um, or protein misfolding. And uh, some of the proteins that we tested it, their effects on lifespan and protein aggregation, like uh, CAN1, which is a, a protein that is involved associated with nedulation. And nedulation is associated in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, increase in ventilation in the, in the uh, uh, Alzheimer's brain causes uh, the neurons uh, to apop go into apoptosis. And ventilation, NED8, has been shown to be increased even in the cancer oral carcinoma cells that uh, there is a, uh, an increase in ventilation uh, 
the contributing for cancer also. And uh, so, Srini's touched on another point that's important here, which is that the other area in which PIP3 and PI3K have been intensively studied is cancer research because of their requirement for cell replication. So, and cancer researchers have done a lot of work trying to find global inhibitors. They don't mind killing the cells, we prefer not to. But we've done some work and intend to publish it soon on the uh, PIP3 binding proteins in cancer course. because those haven't been characterized. And more than half of the cancers actually have abnormal levels of PAP3 or PAP2 and uh, there is mutations in P10 and PI3K uh, that have been reported uh, extensively in the in the cancer field. P10 is an anti-oncogene but it's the opposing phosphatase that takes away the, the, the phosphate at the three position that PI3K puts on. That's right. So looking to the future, we we would like to pursue some of these downstream proteins and look for drugs that specifically target them and see if we can um, recreate some of the uh, beneficial effects of uh, the very long-lived mutant. But, um, you know, we can't pursue all of these. So uh, if anybody out there is interested in uh, picking up the baton where we maybe have dropped it, um, we'd be very happy to collaborate uh, or, or just consult to advise you on what we're, what we're following through and what we're not following through on because um, there's really a, a treasure trove here of candidate proteins that's more than we can uh, pursue. Right, we are just touching the tip of the iceberg because these are the PIP3 proteins when lately there is more involvement of uh, PI3K signal transduction in obesity also. So we have we have noticed a um, um, lot of crosstalk among the PAP3 binding proteins in the uh, high fat fed mice or um, or even in the uh, obese models. Um, so there is a lot of uh, future for yeah. these proteins yeah. as targets for therapeutic intervention. So taking everything together, I would sum up by saying that we have. Uh, uncovered a host of proteins and I think this is just the beginning of the uh, story of pursuing their downstream effects and there's a, a lot still to be done. I would encourage people to join the uh, this very interesting pursuit to uh, really learn how things downstream of AKT happen in cells, both cancer cells and in normal aging and in neurodegenerative diseases because clearly there's uh, right. there's crosstalk there. Right.